thanks very much. I'm delighted to be invited by the Kripke Center to speak to you and to return to Creighton University, uh, where I began my professional career, as Gene just mentioned. I'm also uh, grateful to Ron Sintens for the invitation. Um, the campus, since I've been here, has changed rather dramatically. Uh, it's quite a beautiful campus. I do happen to remember, though, that in that long distance past, the winters seem to be a bit colder than they <laughs> turn out to be today. Um, when I first came here as an assistant professor, the philosophy department was located in a rehabbed dorm, a rather down at the heels dorm, I have to say. But I was delighted when at least I was shown my office, which was quite spacious. Um, but then I looked around a little more carefully, and I saw the plumbing had been removed. It was, in fact, the shower room for that floor. <laughs> uh, they neglected to remove the drain, so right in the middle of my floor, very conveniently, was a drain for the cigarette bus that the students at that time were going to put out on my floor. Um, it was a really a wonderful time when I was here. At that period, the skirmishes between evolutionary theorists and, at the time, those who were called scientific creationists had just begun, and the conflagration that occurred a little bit later was just on the horizon. The descendants of um, the scientific creationists are now called intelligent designers, and they too have taken up the cudgels against uh, evolutionary theory, as we understand it. Their animosity has been reciprocated by many evolutionary biologists. Um, several books by biological theorists, such as Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Samuel Harris, have argued that science, and particularly evolutionary science, and the modes of reasoning characteristics of science, argue strongly against any belief in God. The conclusion of Dawkins books, The God Delusion, is, and they're quoting him, God almost certainly does not exist. The position of striking materialistic atheism expressed by Dawkins and many of that company, whom I just mentioned, stands, I think, in some contrast to the attitudes of scientists writing in the wake of the publication of Darwin's <coughs> Origin of Species in 1859. Many of the early proponents of Darwinian theory were both spiritualists, that is, they believed in a metaphysics which was uh, allowed for a uh, non-material entity uh, existing in the world and human beings being composed partly of uh, non-materialistic, uh, many non-materialistic features. They integrated their scientific views uh, with a definite, sometimes a rather indefinite theology. Uh, Asa Gray, William James, George Romanes, Conway Lloyd Morgan are just a few of the prominent scientists uh, who advocated evolutionary theory in, those, in that early period, who yet rejected a stony, desic desiccated materialism. Even Darwin himself might be brought to witness to the implications of evolutionary theory for religion. He wrote to his friend, the American botanist and theologian Asa Gray, um, just after the publication of The Origin of Species, he said, I did not intend to write atheistically, although there were some charges to that effect. On quite the contrary, the origin of species lays out a kind of natural theology, one in which natural selection operates in an, in, uh, an intelligent, godlike fashion. Indeed, uh, one, I think, with careful examination, can see that Darwin formed the idea of natural selection against the model of the recently departed creator. In his autobiography, Darwin affirmed that when he had completed the origin in 1859, he still believed in an intelligence guiding the fortunes of the universe. In our own time, Stephen Jay Gould has argued that evolutionary theory and other scientific pronouncements uh, are neutral in respect to a belief in God. He claims that, uh, or claimed that science and religion inhabited quite distinct epistemic domains. Science describes the empirical character of the universe, and according to Gould, religion establishes moral values and ultimately discusses the meaning of life. This is a kind of irenicism that militant Darwin 
Darwinian atheists disdain, and I think they disdain it uh, for good reasons. In the abstract, science may not clash with religion, um, fundamentalist religion excluded, but many contemporary scientists do reject religion, and this is especially true of biologists, who, if you just did a survey of the sciences, harbor the least amount of religious belief. On the other side, of course, religious thinkers, especially fundamentalists, regard evolutionary science as perhaps the greatest error and most profound danger of our times. But here's the question I want to pursue in this talk. What's been the cause or causes of the transition from attitudes in the wake of Darwin's accomplishment when the major denominations came rather quickly to terms with evolutionary theory to the contemporary period when evolution seems the main oppositional force to religion. During the 19th century and through the 20th centuries, the, the cultural representation of evolutionary doctrine became more and more to take on a different cast. Evolutionary theory became popularly understood as materialistic and non-theistic, not completely atheistic. I believe this cultural understanding is principally due to the tremendous impact and the polarizing influence of Ernst Haeckel, who was no? <coughs> there we go. That is Ernst Haeckel. And I'll tell you a little more about him in a moment. I suspect that many in this audience. Uh, don't recognize the name of Ernst Haeckel. However, had you been alive at the beginning of the 20th century, you would have been in no doubt about who Ernst Haeckel was. So I think I, what I'm going to argue is that this man is principally the source for that kind of separation of science and religion, the conflict that exists between them. So, um, had Heckel not lived, I think, the evolution, evolutionary theory would have turned probably a less strident face toward the general public. Now, to make the argument about Heckel's impact, I want to um, introduce some statistics. So, um, the Gallup poll, which has been taken on this question from about the early 80s to the present, uh, traces out the American populace's attitudes about uh, evolutionary theory. Uh, the top line indicates those who uh, believe that species and human beings uh, have always existed in the form that they now represent, and that God had created them some long time ago, just in the way that we see them. Uh, the, medium, the middle line indicates the percentage of the population over the course of the several years, years almost 20 years, uh, who think that evolutionary transitions occurred, but that God principally guided those transitions. And the bottom line yeah, indicates the percent of the population who believe that uh, evolutionary transformations were perfectly natural processes and required no divine help at all. The, it will not surprise you, I suppose, to learn that um, church attendance has an impact, is a variable in these percentages, so that the top line represents those who um, attend church most often. And education is also a variable. You can see this is going to be a challenge here. Um, with greater education, uh, a firmer conviction about evolutionary theory occurs, so that those who have high school or less, um, that portion of the population gives the least credence to uh, evolutionary transmutation, uh, and the most toward, well, they believe at a 27% level that God created the species as we see them, and most of them have no opinion at all. And as the educational level rises, so does the uh, belief in evolution. The, the green line indicating a belief in evolution doesn't distinguish those who believe it only to be a naturalistic process and those who believe it to be driven by uh, God, so that that doesn't distinguish the two. These statistics are, I think, a rough approximation for religious belief more generally, so that 
in the American populace uh, since about the beginning of the 20th century to the present, about 80 to 85 percent of uh, Americans have a faith in a personal God. That has remained fairly steady. As far as scientists go, um, there, has, there have been some rather interesting changes. <coughs> so, in 1914, a man by the name of James Loiva, a, a psychologist, did a survey of scientists. And in that survey, he asked the question about whether they had, whether they believed in a personal God. And a belief in a personal God was indicated by the, you believe it was a intelligence who heard prayers and answered those prayers. And of all scientists of 1914, 41.8% uh, expressed such a belief. He distinguished, distinguished the run-of-the-mill scientists from those who had achieved some distinction, and there was a slightly lower belief there, 31.6%. Uh, he discriminated the different disciplines, and if you just compare, say, physicists and biologists, a physicist came in with 34.8% of physicists believed in a personal God, but only 16.9% of biologists. That kind of survey was undertaken again in the light, uh, late 1960s. You're going to have to um, forgive me. I think I'm just going to. Yeah. So, in the late 1960s, the survey was done again. And of all scientists in that period, you see that roughly the same percentage had a belief in a personal God. Among greater scientists, as they were called, those who are members of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, Science, and that is a rather distinguished group, only 7% expressed a belief in a personal God. And again, if you distinguish physicists from biologists, you see that the physicists are at 7.5%, and biologists really um, at the lowest level, about 5.5% express a belief in a personal God. So the question is, while uh, religious belief has remained fairly steady throughout the 20th century among the population at large. What accounts for this precipitous decline in belief among scientists? You see, it's a belief, among, especially among the, those distinguished scientists, so uh, resulting in only 5.5% of biologists. Well, I think person largely responsible, indeed, is uh, Ernst Haeckel. Oh. Sorry about this. Uh, here's Haeckel on his way to Canary Islands in 1867 with his associate, Nipupo McClay. Uh, Ernst Haeckel is a name to conjure with. And as I said, if you were alive at the beginning of the 20th century, you would be in no doubt about who he was. Uh, his books sold in numbers that uh, would be the envy of any popular novelist today. Uh, prior to the First World War, more people learned of evolutionary theory through Heckel's voluminous writings than through any other source, including Darwin's own. His book, The Weltwitz, or The World Puzzles, was published in 1899, sold something like 400,000 copies between 1899 and 1914 getting into the First World War, and that only in the German editions. It was translated into something like 30 languages, including Esperanto and Hindi. Aside from the more um, popular spread of evolutionary ideas, Haeckel was responsible for many major developments in evolutionary theory, in the technical side of evolutionary theory. He trained many of the most eminent German researchers of the next uh, generation, uh, Richard and Oscar Hertwig, Wilhelm Ruh, Anton Dorn, Hans Driesch, and Nick Hyde and Kukla McClay, who is his assistant, indicated here. Uh, this photograph was taken uh, just before he uh, embarked for the Canary Islands and for a research trip. And on the way from Jena, where he taught to uh, the Canaries, he passed through England and visited Charles Darwin at Down House. Uh, he became quite friendly with Charles Darwin. He visited Darwin three times in England. And they carried on quite a uh, voluminous correspondence. Heckel's relations with his contemporaries was quite mixed. Um, many of uh, other biologists uh, thought that he was an extraordinary scientist. Others disdained him completely. I even went to uh, the Golden Brothers Hertwig, Oscar and Richard Hertwig, two students whom 
Uh, he trained. Uh, Richard was always a disciple right through the 1920s. Uh, Heckel died in 1919. Uh, his uh, brother Oscar, however, grew to loathe Ernst Heckel. He had a magnetic personality, and a magnet, as you know, has two poles, one attracts and one repels. Uh, Heckel, as I mentioned, carried on a large correspondence with Darwin, Thomas Henry Huxley. He wrote on human evolution prior to Darwin. Uh, he was convinced of evolutionary theory after he had read Darwin's Origin of Species in 1861 in the German edition. But uh, Darwin had not yet talked about human evolution in the Origin of Species. The, that species conspicuously absent <coughs> is the human species. Uh, Darwin doesn't talk about it. He thought that had he uh, discussed human evolution, people would have been transfixed by that and would not have given proper attention to the theory that he was developing in that book. But in 1871, he did write another book called um, The Descent of Man and, and Selection in Relation to Sex. And in that book, he does this, uh, discuss in great detail human evolution. But prior to that, uh, Heckel uh, beat him to the punch. And in his book, Die Naturliche Schaffungsgeschichte, The Natural History of Creation, uh, he, he applies evolutionary theory to human beings Heckel was an artist, and he very graphically illustrated all of his own works. In fact, I think that's why his books were so more popular than those of Darwin. Because in a simple diagram here, uh, illustration, I think rather crude for our taste, but uh, nonetheless, he basically captures the gist of human evolution in that one diagram. So that uh, his own works uh, were quite, quite popular. Heckel is responsible for uh, the biogenetic law that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That is, that is an idea that you find in Charles Darwin, but Darwin doesn't have too much of it, but it became the cornerstone for Heckel's own evolutionary biology. The idea is this, that um, in embryogenesis, that embryos of historically closely related uh, species in this case, you have a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human being. In their earliest phases of uh, embryo development, they will be similar to one another because the assumption is they have descended from a common ancestor who had a similar form. And as embryogenesis continues, uh, the forms are differentiated. Uh, this was a view that embroiled Heckel in many controversies. Um, Heckel, as I say, illustrated all of his own works, and some thought that he exaggerated some of the features of the human embryo to make it more animal-like. Heckel introduced uh, evolutionary trees into the depiction of evolutionary transformations. Uh, Darwin in The Origin of Species has only one lone illustration, and that is a very abstract illustration of um, not even um, num uh, indicated by species names, but just by letters. Uh, on the contrary, Heckel uh, proliferated these trees and all of his works. He illustrated various features of evolutionary transitions by such trees. And here you see the tree of the vertebrates. Um, the vertical axis indicates time, and the horizontal axis indicates morphological uh, separation. Heckel was a artist. And wherever he went on his research trips, some 20 research trips during his lifetime, rather extensive trips, uh, he took his sketch pads and easels. Uh, he had a significant impact on what was called Jungenstil in Germany, Art Deco in the United States and Europe. Uh, and he also rode on the wave of the popularity of Paul Gauguin, and you can perhaps detect that in this painting that comes from Ceylon. Heckel has been charged by some of contributing to the biology of the Nazis. Uh, and part of Heckel's reputation has been solid because of that association, or at least the charge, that his biology became the foundation for Nazi biology. I don't think there's anything to that charge, but it's one that has stuck. And if you visit any creationist or intelligent design websites, they, uh, they are full of that kind of charge. And I'll talk a little more about that. A moment. Uh, 
while working on his habilitation, and if you know anything about German academics, even today, if you have aspirations to teach in a German university, you have to write what amounts to two dissertations. Uh, the second dissertation is called the Habilitationsschrift. It's just another research effort and you, that would be published as a book. Uh, Heckel went to southern Italy and he did research on a group of organisms really little known at the time called Radiolaria. Uh, these are one-celled organisms that are about the size of a head of a pin and they secrete a skeleton of silica and depending on the species these will take different forms and he discovered myriads of these and gives them a description and it's when he was working on his habilitation that he read the German edition of Darwin's Origin of Species and became convinced that that theory uh, explained a good deal about these creatures that he had dug up. While he was in southern Italy um, he wrote often to his betrothed back in Germany. Uh, it was his first cousin, Anna Seta. Uh, the love letters to Anna are something delicious to read. Uh, they are, um, they, they are, are covered with little illustrations. They are uh, infused with poetry, particularly repetitions of the poetry of Goethe, uh, which uh, Goethe which uh, Heckel was a big fan. He was deliriously in love with this woman, and the publication of the Radiolarian work uh, won for him a, what amounted to an assistant professorship at Jena. It was a book, uh, when it was published in 1863, that he sent to Darwin by way of introduction. It's, it's a huge two-volume work, uh, the second volume devoted to the kind of plates that I just showed you. Uh, when Darwin saw it, he thought it was the most magnificent book that he had ever seen, and that was his introduction to Ernst Haeckel. Uh, the publication of the book and the attainment of a position at Jena allowed him to marry uh, his first cousin, Anna Seta. And as I said, if you wanted to be a famous scientist in the 19th century, it was almost obligatory that you marry your first cousin. It seemed like they all did, Charles Darwin included. On his 30th birthday, uh, in 1864, um, he won a prestigious prize for his radiolarian work. The birthday, however, was covered in darkness. Anna Seta, his wife of 18 months, suddenly died, uh, probably of a burst appendix. Uh, Heckel was devastated. Uh, his family thought he might commit suicide, and they sent him to the south of France to recover. And um, while he was there, um, he writes them a searing letter that indicates a complete change in his psychological makeup. Let me just read to you a portion of that letter, because I think it explains a good deal about, it has larger implications, as I'll try to indicate. And here's part of the letter. The last eight days have passed painfully. The Mediterranean, which I so love, has affected at least a part of the healing cure for which I had hoped. I had become much quieter and began to find myself in an unchanging pain, though I don't understand how I shall bear it in the long run. He's writing to his parents. You conclude that man is intended for a higher godlike development, while I hold that from so deficient and contradictory a creation as man, a personal progressive development after death is not probable. More likely is a progressive development of the species on the whole, as Darwinian theory has already proposed it. Mephisto has it right. Everything that arises and has value comes to nothing. If religious commitment um, means a set of adopting a set of theological propositions regarding the nature of God, the soul, and an afterlife, Heckel was never really much of a religious enthusiast. He was, his family was influenced by the theologian Schleiermacher um, and that attitude and that sort of theological perspective kept his commitment rather vague. But his association with the evangelical church uh, after the death of his wife, those slender threads that kept him attached to the church, uh, they were roughly uh, uh, cut. He, he became a devotee of Darwin's evolutionary theory. The passions that had bound him to one individual and her lingering shadow became 
transformed into acid recriminations against any individual or institution, promoting what he saw uh, through Darwinian eyes as a cynical superstition. Heckel began to cultivate, in a formal way, his alternative to orthodoxy. Uh, in 1882, he, he conducted a lecture at Eisenach, which is not far from Leipzig. Uh, it was in commemoration of Charles Darwin. Darwin had died the previous spring, and he was remembering Darwin in this lecture. He represented Darwin as one who had solved the great problem posed by Immanuel Kant, namely, how a purposively directed form of organization can arise without the aid of a purposively effective cause. In his lecture, he represented Darwinism as thoroughly modern. It was the wave of the future. It was liberal and decidedly opposed to religious dogmatism. To drive this message home, he quoted a letter that Darwin sent to one of Heckel's students. The student was a Russian nobleman who was troubled by his own studies in science and what that might imply for his own religious convictions. Undoubtedly, that trouble was exacerbated by uh, his mentor, Ernst Heckel. Uh, so the nobleman wrote Darwin with a certain set of questions about the relation of science and religion. Uh, Darwin wrote back, and the student obviously showed the letter to Heckel, and Heckel read the letter at this lecture. And it's a very short letter. It reads, so this is to the, uh, the uh, student. Dear sir, I am much engaged, an old man, and out of health, and I cannot spare time to answer your questions fully, nor indeed can they be answered. Science has nothing to do with Christ, except insofar as the habit of scientific research makes a man cautious in admitting evidence. For myself, I do not believe that there ever has been any revelation. As for a future life, every man must judge for himself between conflicting vague probabilities. Wishing you happiness, I remain, dear sir, dear space Charles Darwin. Uh, that letter was, uh, and Heckel's lecture was published in, uh, in Germany, throughout the in German newspapers, and it reached England. Uh, it, in, it gave um, foundation for those who suspected that Darwinism did lead to atheism. And on the other hand, it, it irritated to no end Darwin's disciples who, through a kind of gentleman's agreement, uh, they did not want to blow away the myths of ambiguity concerning Darwin's own rejection of religious orthodoxy. Through the next two decades, Heckel reiterated the message of his Eisenach lecture and expanded the negative critique into a positive one, namely that of monism. In 1892, he was invited to a conference in a small German city, and when the previous lecturer had some, said something perfectly inane about the relationship between science and religion, Heckel threw away his notes and extemporized. He later redacted that lecture that he gave on the fly, and it became Monismus als Bahn zwischen Religion und Wissenschaft, that is, Monism as a Bond between Religion and Science. The book went through 17 editions during his lifetime, um, and he died in 1919. It became the foundation for the even more popular book, uh, Die Weltreise, or The World Puzzles, which would be published in 1899. As I mentioned, the book sold in numbers that uh, I think even John Grissom or Stephen King might be slightly envious of. Um, it sold in the hundreds of thousands, and as I mentioned, it was translated into, into virtually every known <coughs> language and many unknown languages, as it were, of the world. In both of these books, Heckel argued for a unity of the world in which homogeneous atoms of matter expressed various properties through the fundamental powers of attraction and repulsion. These atoms propagated their effects through vibrations set up in an ocean of ether, from the inorganic to the simplest or organisms right at command, no unbridgeable barriers arose. Rather, there was a continuous law-governed unity that ran through the whole. Even what might be called man's soul, which Heckel identified with the human nervous system, appeared over the course of ages by slow increments of antecedents in lower animals. Heckel thought that this view allowed psychologists, for example, 
of freedom to examine the cognitive abilities of lower animals in order to understand something about human intelligence. While Hegel wished to whisk away all anthropomorphisms from religion, he did think that there was something worth preserving, and that was the ethical core of traditional orthodoxy, especially Christianity. As he said, doubtless human culture today owes the greater part of its perfection to the spread and ennobling effects of Christian ethics, despite its higher worth often in a regrettable way being injured by its connection with untenable myths and so-called revelation. Heckel was no Nietzschean. He didn't want to simply eliminate um, ethical convictions as in the more traditional kinds of ethical principles. But he wanted to give them a different foundation. And the foundation was one first um, developed by Charles Darwin in that book that I mentioned, The Descent of Man, in which Darwin talked about the fundamental characteristic of ethical behavior, which he thought was altruism, that is, acting for the benefit of another uh, at some cost to self, and that was foundational for Darwin. But he thought that he could give it a good explanation through what he called community selection. Uh, this would be natural selection working on the group. If you're interested, we can talk about this a little bit later. But he too preserved what were the standard ethical principles of, say, Christianity, as did Heckel, only he gave them a different foundation, not in the will of a creator, but in the natural processes of evolution. The response to Heckel's book uh, was extraordinary. There was a hue and outcry, you can get some taste of that outcry, this appeared in a German literary magazine. Here you see Salome dancing with the head of Ernst Heckel before the pole. Um, the German response was quite extreme. Um, it ranged from those who thought, those rather sophisticated theologians, who thought that evolutionary theory was a challenge to Christianity, but a, a challenge that could be met. Although those of a more, much more firmly and committed kind of dogmatism uh, thought that Heckel represented, as quoting one of them, the depth of degradation and despair into which the teachings of Heckel will plunge mankind. Uh, Heckel became a representative of um, evolution militant. Certainly that was the way he was regarded in the American press. So the book the Melt Race, All the World Puzzles, was translated into English, as I mentioned, virtually every other known language. And it was um, reviewed in the New York Times. And here is the way the Times reviewer uh, described the book. One of the objects of Dr. Heckel, it would, not be un it would not be unfair to say the chief object, is to prove that the immortality of the human soul and the existence of a creator, designer, and ruler of the universe are simply impossible. He is not at all an agnostic, far from it. He knows there can be no immortality and no God. The, the complex relations of religion with political parties and revolutionary social movements also had an impact on the suspicion about evolutionary theory in the latter part of the 19th century. It was really through Heckel's offices that many associated with Marxism and communism, people like August Babel, that won't be too much to you, but he was a prominent socialist in the latter part of the 19th century, adopted evolutionary theory in the way that Heckel had described it. So it was associated with these kinds of social movements. Um, we often think uh, of evolutionary theory as somehow being connected with conservative political views, but initially it was the Marxists who uh, took up evolutionary theory because it seemed to provide a foundation for Marx's view about the change of class structure over time. In Germany, the Kepler Bund was formed to oppose, particularly Ernst Haeckel and evolutionary theory generally, it was an organization of Protestant scientists. Um, the leader was Eberhard Denner, who was a botanist and a teacher at the Evangelical Pedagogium in Bad Gerdesburg, it was essentially a high school. Uh, Denner had reacted like an overwound spring to Heckel's Welträtsel and immediately flung off a broadside entitled Die Wahrheit über Ernst Heckel und seine Welträtsel, the truth about Ernst Heckel and his riddle of the universe. 
And before he unwound, over 90 books and pamphlets <coughs> venting his religious enthusiasm sprung from his pen. Uh, many of these were translated into English and became part of the arsenal of fundamentalism in the United States. And indeed, they became part of the series of books called The Fundamentals. So these were collections of pamphlets on various religious questions, but particularly uh, on evolutionary theory. And this is whence fundamentalism derives its name from just the title called Fundamentals. Heckel was attacked by um, an associate of <coughs> Jenner by the name of Brass. He tried to argue that Heckel had committed um, falsehoods. Um, so the, the, the eighth problem, the newest falsifications of embryo uh, illustrations by Dr. Brass. Uh, in this book, this little pamphlet, um, what he argued was that Heckel's representation of the biological, uh, the biogenetic law, namely that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, uh, was falsified in this way. What Brass argued was that the human embryo at that middle level, M2, um, and the given at uh, G2, that Heckel had switched the heads of those two to make the human more given life and the given more human life. Heckel was enraged. It's not true. You can see what, what Heckel did because he was not a, a vertebrate biologist. He was really a marine biologist. He had borrowed many of the illustrations of embryos at these stages from very standard works. And he pointed out where they had come from. And it's quite clear that he represents them exactly. Uh, Heckel threatened newspapers with liable suits if they didn't retract the descriptions of Brass's claims. In addition to the Kepler Bund, a Thomas Bund was formed, that is, an organization of Catholic scientists. And one of the members of that Bund was Eric Bosman. Bosman, a Jesuit, um, a, a terribly interesting fellow. He, in the 1880s, wrote a little book called Der Trichter Wickler. Uh, it's about a leaf-rolling beetle. Uh, he was an entomologist, and really quite an extraordinary entomologist. If you pick up E.O. Wilson's book, Insect Societies, and just look at the bibliography, there are numerous, numerous references to many of the works of Eric Bosman. He was an ant man, just as Wilson is an ant man. Um, this Trichter Bickler, though, had the habit of cutting a pattern in a leaf and then rolling the leaf and laying his eggs in it. And Bosman originally argued that you could not give a mechanical explanation of the geometrical abilities of this little bug. Uh, it could only be a divine geometer that instilled this kind of knowledge in uh, this insect. So that was his oppositional argument to evolutionary theory. But Bosman was no fool. Um, he began studying a group of beetles uh, called the Myrmecophili, or the Inquilines. These are beetles that live in ant nests, and they feed off the pupa of ants. And he did a, geolog a geographical survey of these beetles, and he started off in, in the far eastern part of Europe, looking at ant nests and looking at the beetles living in those ant nests. In the far eastern part, these beetles look like little tanks. They're heavily armored. They live in the ant nest. They eat the ants' pupa. The ants attack them with little consequence because they're so heavily armored. But as you move to the east, you see a gradual transition in the morphology of these beetles till when you get to the far east, they look like ants. And in fact, the ants treat them like other ants. They groom them and feed them. On this basis, Bosman became convinced that evolutionary theory was true. Uh, in eight, uh, 1902, he wrote a book called Evolution and Modern Biology, in which he set out his view about and the evidence for evolutionary theory. Uh, he had a caveat. He thought human intelligence manifested some distinctively different qualities from animal intelligence, so that the most reasonable belief was that at some point God zapped a soul into a hominid who had reached a certain point. But otherwise, he said it's an empirical question. Now, 
And Jesuit, arguing for evolutionary theory, seemed to heckle to be highly suspicious. There had to be some Jesuitical sophistry involved in this. So um, there was a sort of face-off in Berlin. They both gave lectures. Um, Heckel decrying this, what must be a sophist, uh, at work. And Vosfan giving as good as he got. Uh, and he was, his views about evolution became really the fundamental views of the Catholic Church. Um, it's no accident that in 1996, at the meeting of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, Pope John Paul II, um, said that evolution is obviously more than just theory. And his view was quite the same as Bosman's view. As I mentioned, um, Heckel ran afoul of some, of biolog some biologists in the 19th century. Um, and in the 20th century, uh, he has been submerged under some rather shoddy scholarship. Stephen Jay Gould, in his first book on congeny and phylogeny, and then in virtually every collection of his collections of articles that appeared in natural history, uh, he has some article defaming uh, Ernst Haeckel and trying to show that Haeckel was meretricious in his science and that he had to be discounted. The argument, I think, initially stemmed from two sources, that is, Gould's attitude stemmed from two sources. The first was um, that Gould had read a book uh, published in 1971 by a fellow by the name of Daniel Gassman, whom I hesitate to inform you, was uh, got his PhD at the University of Chicago in the history department uh, long before I came on the scene. <laughs> but Gassman had argued that uh, Heckel's biology led almost immediately to the Holocaust, that it was responsible for Nazi violence. And Gould seems to have bought that. He quotes Gassman rather clearly. <coughs> Um, it's significant, I think, before his book in 1977, uh, Gould had an article on uh, Heckel in which he praised Heckel for his ingenuity. But after um, Gassman, he read Gassman's book, and after 1977, he turned a about face. He made it about face. Another source, I think, too, was in 1975, I could ask you, this would be a quiz. Uh, there was a famous book published in biology. So, I will award a prize, if you know, in 1975, what famous book that created a huge controversy. <coughs> mein Kampf? Well, no. <laughs> Trey, that's a little earlier. That's uh, 1927. 25, 26, and 27. Not Mein Kampf. Dean Self, a philosopher, wins the prize. Yes, it was E.O. Wilson's Sociobiology. Uh, Wilson, in that book, a groundbreaking book, um, applied evolutionary theory in its social aspects to, from insect societies to higher vertebrates, and finally to human beings in general. Uh, there was a great deal of animosity between Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton on one side and E.O. Wilson on the other. And I think Gould came to see Wilson as the more the um, contemporary incarnation of Ernst Haeckel. And so for that reason, the animosity was quite extreme. There was another contributing factor to the sort of attacks on Ernst Haeckel, and this is what I'm going to uh, finish with, just to show you the, what's involved in these kinds of disputes. In 1997, um, a British embryologist by the name of Michael Richardson and his colleagues in Britain did a study of embryos at the very earliest stages in embryogenesis. And what Richardson and his colleagues wanted to argue was that embryos at the very earliest stages did not go through a what was called a phylotypical stage, that is, a stage in which, say, vertebrate embryos looked very much alike, that some of them would differ quite considerably, even at this very early uh, stage. He used Heckel's illustrations to show in the 19th century this was a common view. He even used the illustrations from one of Heckel's enemies, which really shows virtually the same thing. At the very early stage, embryos look very much alike. Um, 
And he contended that even in his own time, in the 1990s, embryologists were still maintaining that there was a phylotypical stage for uh, historically related uh, species. That um, argument in that paper that he wrote got picked up by Science Magazine. And what Richardson and his colleagues had done is take pictures of embryos at a very early stage, and they, they used Heckel's illustrations as the, sort of the standard, and they compared their photographs of different species of organisms, the kind that Heckel had described, and showed how very different they were. The editor picked this up and wrote an article called Heckel's Embryos Fraud Rediscovered. And what the article does, I'll, you can't see it too clearly there, but it's comparing at the top row of the photographs of Michael Richardson and at the bottom row of Heckel's illustrations from his 19, 1874 book, Anthropogony. Here I've um, made it a little more clear. So here's the comparison. Uh, they interviewed Richardson, and Richardson claimed that this looked like the biggest fraud that ever existed in uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, so you can see, in fact, if you look at Heckel's representation of the salamander embryo at an early stage, it looks very, very different from that embryo that looks like a lopsided beach ball uh, at the lower level. Um, and the other embryos do look distinctively different. So the only explanation for this is that Heckel committed fraud, that he had fraudulently represented embryos in a comparable fashion at the first level. Now, if you know anything about embryology, you're going to know, realize a few things. Um, Heckel said that he reduced all the embryos to the same size. So the human embryo at that stage will be quite a bit diff uh, larger than, say, the fish embryo or the turtle embryo. But he, he standardized them all to the same size. So, as he said, for greater comparison of their morphological characteristics. Uh, Richardson did the same thing, or at least he claimed to do the same thing. But as you can see, that salamander embryo is about twice as large as the other embryos. He also did something else. That big bulge of the salamander embryo is the yolk sac. Uh, also on the fish and also on the human beings. He left the yolk sacs on those embryos. Heckel says explicitly he took the yolk sac off and all the mat maternal features that would be attached to an embryo, he removed those so you could just see the morphology of the embryos. So, um, you have three embryos that have the yolk sac still attached. The chicken embryo is in a highly circumflex position, and which does attain at a later stage, but at an earlier stage, it's, it's much more in an upright position. With the help of Photoshop, <laughs> you can remove the yolk sac, which I've done, and straighten out the embryo and standardize them all to the same size. And you can see, well, well they're different, but they're not all that different. And if this was the evidence that was available, the article about Heckel committing fraud again would never have been written. The logic of it, well, it defies logic, because what Richardson and his colleagues had argued was that this notion of a phylotypical stage was not only characteristic of Ernst Heckel, it was characteristic of embryologists in the 20th century, and in fact, in his own time. But if Heckel had committed fraud, 130 years ago, when the technologies of representation and investigation were quite a bit more primitive than they are in the 1990s. And these embryos, incidentally, are about the size of the head of a pin. They're very small. Um, how much more would embryologists today be guilty of fraud, since they have a much, um, they have much better technology, much better knowledge of embryo development? But it is that kind of argue, uh, that article in Science Magazine, if you go to Google and you put in fraud and Ernst Tackle, you'll get, as I did yesterday, uh, 300,000 hits. Most of them from creationist websites, intelligent design websites, and even from some really reputable biologists, uh, showing that Tackle had committed fraud, and the evidence is Michael Richardson's um, depictions. The charges against Heckel, um, I think, have many sources. Uh, he was, as I say, a vituperative personality. In the many books that he published, he did not hesitate to um, bait the preachers at every turn uh, and hit them over the head with evolutionary theory, calling it nothing but a superstition. 
In our time, the polarization between evolutionary theorists and uh, <coughs> religious thinkers has become rather extreme. In the case of biologists, only a scant 5% of elite biologists admit to anything like a belief in a personal God. And with people like Dawkins being really the best ally of the religious right, because if you look at Dawkins' arguments, they're pretty lousy arguments. Um, you have all the ingredients for this kind of conflict. The religious right, including those advocating intelligent design, depend on arguments that had some purchase in the 19th century, but must be utterly rejected in the 21st century. They, they depend on a lack of sophistication of the American public in regard to science. I think they inevitably have failed in respect to scientists. Their fate is less certain in the political arena, especially in the kind of political discussions that are now occurring and will occur through November. Thank you very much.